Thank you, Marco, wherever you are, and uh, Daniele, who's not here. But um, for organizing this wonderful conference, and uh, there have been so many splendid talks. I've learned so much. And um, um, I hope that uh, this, if, even if you don't agree with it, you'll at least learn something about the intersection of philosophy, physics, and mathematics. Um, Okay. Not working. Change slides. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, so, in some sense, for our theme, and particularly for the new PhD program that brings together people who are want to do mathematics, physics, and philosophy all together. Um, you could say this is just a case study. It is, however, I think a very significant case study uh, for reasons that I hope will become clear. Philosophers of science for some time have always said, well, it doesn't really matter where the ideas come from. It's how they're used in scientific theories. Um, doesn't really matter what the origins of the idea of local degrees of freedom redundancy at each point of a space where that idea comes from, the idea of gauge. Um, so it doesn't really matter. It's just how we can use it today. I think that's a very narrow view of what philosophy of science is about. I don't think that the story is only window dressing for um, what we know today about uh, gauge invariance. Um, you could say also that, well, there's no big deal here. It was known that the four vector uh, of Maxwell in space time had these redundant degrees of freedom, and that's all that Weil was uh, utilizing, exploiting. I think that's not quite the whole story at all. Here's our champion. Um, and in my view, I think in, we could try to come up with other candidates. Um, there's no other person in the 20th century who made absolutely first-rate contributions to theoretical physics, to mathematics, and to philosophy. The only other person that I would put in that category is the great Henri Poincaré, who died in 1912. Um, these are the... Um, achievements, or just some of the areas of mathematics in which Vial worked. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about, well, a lot about his work in differential geometry and in Lie theory. Um, in theoretical physics, he wrote the first mathematically rigorous textbook, if you can call it a textbook, on the general theory of relativity. Realm Materia in 1918. It went through five editions in five years. Um, there's a new edition coming out, interestingly enough. Um, he invents the gauge principle in 1918, independently of that book. The book was out first. He carried over the idea from its birth in um, the, the contextual uh, background of gravitational theory into quantum mechanics in 1929. He famously introduced, along with Eugene Wigner, he introduced quantum mechanics into, uh, in, introduced group theory into quantum mechanics in 1928. In philosophy of science, he wrote this wonderful book, not widely studied today, but um, I think neglected, uh, unfortunately, uh, Das Continuum, which was a system of predicative analysis. He late, quickly after that joined uh, Brouwer in intuitionism for a few years and uh, later kind of did his own thing that was more or less close to Hilbert's metamathematics. Um, he wrote a wonderful text, one of the classics of philosophy of science, um, still in print from Princeton, um, philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science, um, first in German in 1926 and then translated into English in 1949. A few lecture series at uh, Penn and at Yale in the 1930s. 
and this uh, wonderful philosophical autobiography, Erkenntnis und Beziehung, in 1954. Um, you can make the case, as uh, Atia does here, uh, Fields Medalist, um, that uh, Vile's relevance has not faded. This is a um, revisiting obituary of Vile in the biographical memoirs of the National Academy of Science. Uh, and he says, the passage of time makes it easier to assess the long-term significance of Vile's work to see how his ideas have influenced his successors and helped to shape mathematics and physics in the second half of the 20th century. In fact, the last 50 years have seen a remarkable blossoming of just those areas that Vile initiated. In retrospect, one might almost say that he defined the agenda and provided the pro proper framework for what followed. Now that's not only a reference to gauge theories, started again in, with Yang and Mills in 1954, but it's also a reference to Vile's work on generalizing connections in differential geometry, work that was continued by the great French geometer Cartan, and that led to the theory of fiber bundles. Um, so Vile was a pioneer in all of these areas. And that's some of the stuff that he is alluding to here. Um, I'm going to try to narrow down and suggest that Vile's contributions to our um, triple intersection, physics, mathematics, and philosophy, drew on two philosophical currents. One is the transcendental phenomenology of Edmund Husserl. And the other is what I'll call the infinitesimal agenda set by Leibniz and continued by Riemann and Sophus Lee. A little bit about Husserl, I'm not going to be able to explain transcendental phenomenology to you, but I'm going to let Weil do it for you with what he does in mathematics. Um, but Husserl, of course, um, was a PhD in mathematics. Uh, he got his PhD actually in Vienna, but he was because um, he was Austrian, he wanted to get a job in Austria, but he studied in Berlin under Weierstrass, and um, uh, you can often think of when you're reading Husserl that he does, even though his language is very obscure sometimes, he does think like a mathematician in that he's always seeking to generalize. And this was the kind of starting point for Weil and for Husserlian phenomenology to give an account of objective knowledge begin, beginning with what is given to consciousness. Um, how can consciousness reach or give an object? How can natural science be made comprehensible insofar as with each step, it supposes and posits knowledge of a nature existing in itself? That's the great problem of epistemology. Husserl's answer to this is rooted in something that's called transcendental subjectivity. Um, every existent is relative to transcendental subjectivity. Transcendental subjectivity alone exists in itself and for itself. That was Descartes' message. And it exists in itself and for itself in a hierarchical order corresponding to the constitution that leads to the different levels of transcendental intersubjectivity. So this idea of constitution in steps leading up to what is intersubjective from this purely subjective beginning. From Husserl's text, Ideen, which is the text that Weil knew best, Ideen one. The existence of nature cannot be the condition for the existence of consciousness since nature itself turns out to be a correlate of consciousness. Nature is only as constituted in regular concatenations of consciousness. It's interesting that he says this is uh, going to be misunderstood. In print. Um, indeed it was. <laughs> Where did Weil get his inspiration to uh, read Husserl? Uh, from his wife, Helene Weil, who was a student of Husserl. 
um, in you Göttingen. Know, you take a, after the printing of the book, on the printed the copy, the printed copy of the manuscript. Uh, no, it's in his copy of uh, of the printed book. The printed. Book. Yeah, in the printed book. So if there ever was a second edition, he would try to explain why that's not so to be misunderstood. Well, um, you can see the, uh, the ramifications and the influence of Husserl right away in, um, I'll, don't worry about the German, I'm going to translate it here in a minute. Um, Weil in the first work that he wrote on GR in 1917, on gravitational theory um, is telling us that this his the way that he's presenting GR is through mathematical construction give, <clears throat> based on this immediate givenness of essential insight, the Serlian essential insight or Wesenschau. And here's the uh, German text and the English translation that I've done. I'll read the English. That objective world which physics strives to peel away from our immediately experienced reality can only be captured in its meaningful content through mathematical concepts. However, in order to identify the meaning this mathematical conceptual system possesses for reality, we must somehow attempt to describe its connection to the immediately given. Uh, a task of epistemology that certainly cannot be achieved through physical concepts alone but only through persistent return to the intuitively experienced in consciousness. If you grasp that idea, you'll be able to see what Weil is going to do in inventing the idea of gauge. And then in his famous text, um, there's a preface. Um, I always urge people not to read it in English because it's a completely garbled English translation. Uh, makes um, many, many mathematical errors, but also the philosophical parts are absolutely uh, not understandable. Um, he says something very similar to that last passage, the imminent is absolute. That is, is exact, exactly what it is as I have it and am able to bring its essence to givenness before me in acts of reflection. The given to consciousness is the starting point at which we must place ourselves in order to comprehend the sense and the justification of the posit of reality. Now you can imagine if you're a physicist cracking open Vile's book, um, what you might think of a passage like that at the beginning. We know that the young Heisenberg was one of the first readers of this text. So was Pauli. All right, let's turn to where those passages might be rooted in this infinitesimal agenda set by uh, Leibniz. Let's recall the labyrinth of the continuum uh, where according to Leibniz, continua are not real, they're merely ideal. They're not resolvable into nor composed from determinate elements. And infinitesimals are fictions. Analysis is ideal. In his dynamics, not widely known, force uh, is an infinitesimal element of action responsible for continuous changes in a body state of motion. Um, this is going to be known as vis viva. Turning to Riemann, um, in his great um, test lecture um, that he gave in front of Gauss in 1854 uh, on the hypotheses which lie at the foundation of geometry, Riemann says, questions concerning the immeasurably large are for the explanation of nature useless questions. It is quite otherwise, however, with questions concerning the immeasurably small knowledge of the causal connection of phenomena is based essentially upon the precision with which we follow them down into the infinitely small. <laughs> and then in Sophus Lee, in the theory of transformation groups that was completed by Engel after Lee's death, 
we, one sees in the passage from finitely separated points to ones infinitely close, there is a complete leap, and that to infinitely close points belong entirely other laws than those belonging to points at finite separation. And what he's referring to here is the structure known as a Lie group, although that is Weil's term, not Lee's. Mm -hmm. Weil is the first to use the term Lie group in 1924. So we linearize, linearize in passing to the infinitesimal uh, tangent space of the group identity. Here's Vial to kind of sum up these three influences in a, um, the, the text that I mentioned earlier, one of the classics of philosophy of science, as the true lawfulness of nature according to Leibniz's continuity principle finds its, its, its expression in Nahe Wirkens uh, you know, next to next acting laws. So the basic relations of geometry should concern only infinitely closely adjacent points. And this is a nearby geometry in opposition to a distant geometry. Only in the infinitely small may we expect to encounter elementary and uniform laws. Hence the world must be understood from its behavior in the infinitely small. This thought is um, expressed again in these lectures that he gave in Barcelona and Madrid uh, in 1923. The productivity shown by the differential calculus by contiguous action field physics and by Riemannian geometry certainly rests upon the principle to understand the world according to its form and content from its behavior in the infinitely small, clearly because all problems can be linearized in passing to the infinitely small. And then, in, again, in those lectures, uh, the replacement of finite group through the infinitesimal, that is, again, the return to the infinitely small, the chief idea of Lie theory. So, we have a philosophy of space that is an idealism in the infinitesimal. Um, this is a very nice book uh, by Julian Bernard, um, came out in 2015. And so what does that really mean, idealism of the infinitesimal? It's an epistemological metaphysical mandate that comprehensibility of the physical world is only to be obtained by mathematical construction beginning with the given to consciousness. The realm of the given to consciousness, what he calls the ego's immediate life of intuition, is mathematically realized in the tangent space of continua. It's the locus or the ego center positing elementary linear relations in the infinitely small region surrounding the point in the tangent space. So this is going to permit only local relations of comparison via linear connections, connections between neighboring points. And this infinitely small or the tangent space is the immediate locus of mathematical construction via transcendental subjectivity. Um, it's the horizon within which mathematical construction can be done with evidence. And that's the Husserlian term for um, what's immediate to consciousness. Weil says, uh, here in a later lecture already in 1931, when he has more or less abandoned his field theory program and gone back to pure mathematics, um, only in the spatio-temporally co coinciding and the immediate spatial-temporal neighborhood has a directly clear meaning exhibited in intuition. The philosophers may have been correct that our space of intuition bears a Euclidean structure regardless of what physical experience says. I only insist that to this space of intuition belongs the ego center and that the relations of the space of intuition to that of physics become vaguer the further the distance from the ego center. So if you know about um, 
how you map a tangent space onto a manifold. And as you get further wet further away, this the character of this mapping becomes uh, more and more arbitrary. The two works that introduce the idea of gauge are a work called uh, Pure Infinitesimal Geometry in 1918, and then famously the paper Gravitation and Electricity, which he published in the uh, Proceedings of the Prussian Academy. Famously, um, the <clears throat> editors or the people who were vetting those submissions to the Prussian Academy asked Einstein to write a reply and it get, and we'll get to that. So, um, in Riemannian geometry, and so in Einstein's pseudo Riemannian uh, general theory of relativity, that's with Lorentz's signature, bears the trace of distant geometry because it permits a direct comparison of lengths at distant points. Reason for this, vectors have two properties, magnitude and direction. In a Riemannian manifold, you can parallel transport a vector around a closed curve, returning to its initial point. Its direction may change, its curvature, its magnitude will remain the same. And Weil viewed this as an inconsistency a lingering trace of the old Euclidean distance geometry. This is parallel transport for those of you who don't know it, it's very quite simple. Um, but I want to insist here that the important point is the difference with Riemannian geometry, where the vector direction changes in transport around the closed curve, but the magnitude always remains the same. So um, this is um, the operation of Riemannian geometry, a Levechevita connection that transports the direction of a vector uh, and holonomically that can change and the length holonomically. Weil says, but a truly local geometry should know only a principle of length transference from one point to another infinitely close by. So his remedy was to adopt a new connection, a length connection. Uh, here is a, a, val a real valued one form. You apply it to a tans tangent vector at some point, and you multiply the initial length at P uh, you, under this length connection is going to give you an increment of a nearby point, infinite, testimony nearby point dx, P prime. And so the length is going to change slightly and continuously in the transport from P to P prime. So comparison of quantities at finite distance from P means you have to integrate that length connection over the path connecting the two points. And in general, with this connection, you get a curvature. He called it length curvature. Um, and this is generally non-zero. And what this means that the um, you have a conformal geometry, angles are preserved, but not lengths, and that similarities are the basic transformations of space structure. There's no natural unit that can be assumed in geometry a priori. This gives a scale-free physics. Well, then you have to choose a scale. Um, and according to Weil, Weil, you do this freely and independently at every point of the manifold. This he called gauging M. And doing so, you arrive at a Riemannian or Lorentzian metric with the familiar uh, Riemannian uh, line element. So now, to specify the metric, we need not only the metric tensor, we need the length connection to specify a metric in a chosen gauge. And to assure consistency, um, a different choice of scale um, is going to be um, uh, respected by the length connection uh, in that transformation from uh, one choice of scale to another. He turned this 
term this a gauge transformation. Thinking here of railroad gauges, because the vial is in Zurich and railroad gauges um, in S Switzerland were narrower than German railroad gauges, the distance between the tracks. But then the physical interpretation is interesting. He says, in this theory, all physical quantities have a world geometrical meaning. So this gave him a serendipitous unification of gravitation and electromagnetism because he's going to identify the one form length connection with the four potential of electromagnetism. This yields under differentiation, which is the length curvature of Faraday two form, and it's vanishing. These are the two homogeneous Maxwell equations. So simply by changing the idea that a vector has to change its magnitude as well as its length, Weil gets mathematical terms that he identifies with known terms of electromagnetism. And so electromagnetism is automatically part of the Weil geometry. And he demanded, therefore, invariance of the generally covariant combined gravitational electromagnetic field equations under simultaneous gauge transformations. Um, this will show up uh, in philosophy, mainly in discussions um, in French, actually, but um, uh, in the logical empiricist, Hans Reichenbach famously wrote a, an appendix to his classic text on philosophy of space and time, critiquing Weil. Um, um, what you're doing here is you're getting rid of the notion of the practically rigid rods and perfect clocks that Einstein had talked about in his lecture, Geometry and Experience, in 1921. How do you connect this mathematical structure of GR to um, what you can observe? Well, you need to have these tools of what Einstein called practically rigid rods and uh, perfect clocks. And Weil, of course, can't admit the notion of perfect clocks and rigid rods because these presuppose uh, units that are fixed. So he showed that the metric can be constructed up to scale freedom from the projective and conformal properties of his geometry. And these correspond respectively to uh, freely falling test particle trajectories and light rays. And this has been uh, rehabilitated by Ehlers, Perani, and Schild very famously in this uh, paper, The Geometry of Free Fall and Light Propagation. There's a wonderful little text on GR by Bob Garosh, um, General Relativity from A to B, that uses the same uh, instruction without attribution to Weil. So by removing these distant geometry inconsistencies from Riemannian geometry, Weil derived a geometry which to his surprise, he could construct mathematical expressions not only for gravity, but for electromagnetism. Uh, insofar as one seeing that removing the uh, above mentioned in, uh, inconsistency, one comes to a geometry, which in a surprising way applied to the world, um, explains not only the phenomena of gravity, but also those of the electromagnetic field. Um, so this led to a, a brief program that Weil uh, embarked upon from 1918 to 1923. Um, and uh, I'm not going to say too much about it here in the interest of uh, time, but um, you can read about it. And it was quite um, influential in as far as Eddington took it up and um, generalized Weil's geometry even further than Weil himself had done 
uh, with the notion of a connection. And so did Cartown. Yes. Yes. Well, I told you that in Vile's paper in the Proceedings of the Berlin Academy, uh, the editors had insisted that Einstein write a reply. Uh, and in it, he called it a feat of genius of the first rank, um, but he objected that the phenomena of um, spectral analysis essentially shows us that there are such things as perfect clocks and rigid rods. This is the famous um, uh, objection that, look, hydrogen in the lab, when we look at its spectral signature, we get these distances between the lines. If we're looking at uh, stars that are coming towards us, it's shifted, but the same distances respectively between the lines, stars going away from us, stars coming towards us, going to be the shifted in the other direction, blue shifted, mm -hmm. but the same relative distances between the, the lines. So um, this, for Einstein, ruled out Vile's theory as unphysical. Vile wasn't convinced. Um, I think partly he thought his theory was too beautiful not to be true. Um, but he, and he offered an, a, a response to Einstein's objection. And it's a subtle response, and we can get into it in the question period if you like, but it has to do with these two different tendencies that he said that all physical quantities have, a tendency of um, persistence and uh, one of adjustment. So in a sense, the idea is that quantities both persist in maintaining their value, but they also have to adjust to where they are in the field. Now, he, by 1924, he'd returned to uh, pure mathematics, actually as a, as a result of working in uh, tensor calculus. There's a wonderful book by Thomas Hawkins on the emergence of the theory of Lie groups that goes into this in, in some detail. He devotes himself to pure mathematics and, and then this leads to the theory of group representations. Uh, he does his most important mathematical work in 24, 25, 26 on um, representations of semi-simple Lie groups. Uh, 1925, 1926 comes quantum mechanics. And Weil is right there paying attention, um, and he sees opportunities for group theoretic structure in quantum mechanics. His paper, Quantum Mechanics and Group Theory from 1927 becomes a book in 1928, translated into English in 1931 in a second edition by H.P. Roberts. So it looks like Weil has given up his theory. Not quite. In 1929, he comes to the new gauge principle in three papers. Um, these are largely um, duplications of one another. Um, the one in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy is largely a translation of the German one, which um, he had, was spending time then at Princeton, so he um, published it in English and uh, came out in German. And then he gave lectures at the Rice Institute in Houston on the topic. These are a little more expansive. What's the context um, at that time? Um, from this paper in 1928 of Einstein, this. Um, new possibilities for a unified field theory of gravity and electromagnetism, electricity. Um, he, Einstein uses the idea of distant parallelism, which is essentially to bring back distant geometry with a vengeance. Um, Vial comments, Einstein assumes distant parallelism, that is the axes in different points shall be so bound to one another that when one rotates the axis, all other points automatically undergo the same rotation. I do not believe in this distant parallelism at all. There is no indication that nature has availed herself of such an artificial geometry. 
Well, there was another motivation as well, which is the uh, Dirac theory of the relativistic electron, uh, which introduced into physics new types of physical quantities that are not tensors, spinners. Um, uh, famously, C.G. Darwin said something slipped through the net, um, a, a new kind of fish. Uh, this required a new conceptual framework for uh, conceptual symbolic construction. How do you construct these spinners, these linear quantities, and you retain the covariant linear quantities of gravity and electromagnetism? And this gives us a new, or gave Weil a new possibility space uh, introducing a new arbitrariness that, as with general relativity, can be removed by a principle of invariance. He tells us in these papers, and I'll give you three quotations here in a row, one from each of these papers, because he says the same thing. This is the central message. Um, since the gauge, since gauge invariance uh, contains an arbitrary function lambda, it has the character of general relativity and can naturally only be understood in its domain. So the gauge principle is only to be understood in the context of GR. Um, same thing in English in the Rice Institute paper, the principle of gauge invariance has the character of general relativity since it contains an arbitrary function lambda and can certainly only be understood in terms of it. And in the PNAS paper, this new principle of gauge invariance, which may go by the same name, has the character of general relativity since it contains an arbitrary function lambda and can certainly only be understood with reference to it. Um, it's important to realize what he called the postulate of freedom. So um, the idea here, and at curved space time, the local virbina or tetrads should be able to rotate independently at each point. And if the tetrads can vary, so also the gauge factor. So in the general theory of relativity, when we remove the restriction binding the local axis systems to one another, we cannot avoid allowing the gauge factor to depend arbitrarily on position. Um, this is really a tale of three connections. Uh, here I'm indebted to work of Alexander Afria. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip through these. These are uh, would take a little bit too much time to uh, explain. Um, but essentially what you're doing is by introducing a third connection, which looks familiar because it's the, the one that's um, going to be mathematically identical in electromagnetism. This is going to uh, account for the uh, gauge freedom, U1 freedom, unitary group uh, freedom, lying in between the groups of tetrads and the groups of, the, of spinners, the Lie group, and their, their algebras. <clears throat> but is, as in 1918, you can make the same identification so you can recover the Maxwell equations as a consequence of gauge invariance. Uh, and um, essentially with uh, this setting of gauge invariance now in the quantum mechanical setting into general relativity, the principle of gauge invariance becomes self-evident. He says the local axis system, the tetrads, does not determine the components of the spinner uniquely, but only with a gauge factor of absolute matter magnitude one. As in the general theory of relativity, when we remove the restriction, binding the local axis systems to each other, we cannot avoid allowing the gauge factor to depend arbitrarily on position. The principle of gauge invariance becomes self-evident. So um, you have these conserved quantities uh, corresponding to the infinitesimal symmetries. The rotations of frames are a symmetry of the um, uh, stress energy tensor. The infinitesimal coordinate system transformations uh, gives you the conservation of energy and momentum. 
and the uh, U1 gauge transformation is conservation of charge. But he emphasizes he's not giving us a theory. What he's done is he set the Dirac theory in the context of general relativity by introducing this new principle of gauge invariance. But this is really a framework for a still to be quantized theory that, that's going to have to resolve problems with the Dirac theory because it has twice too many energy levels. These are the famous holes in the energy C. That was at the time. Um, I'm going to give you a rational reconstruction of Vial's 1929 uh, gauge argument um, that now involves uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics because this is how it's thought about today where we understand gauge as an arbitrary phase of matter wave functions with the abelian Lie group a U1. And then you have the Maxwell-Dirac Lagrangian for the free electron field transforming invariantly under the global U1 phase transformation. Global means it's applying at each point in the same way. And so the global invariance of the system implies via Noether's theorem the existence of a conserved quantity, the current. What you do now is you promote that global symmetry to a local symmetry. Essentially, you want to gauge that global U1 phase symmetry. This introduces a phase parameter that is going to vary as a function of space-time position. And this is a local phase invariance. You can see now that the phase factor depends on position. Now, typically, your Lagrangian depends not only on the field, but on its first derivative. So in imposing the local symmetry, the derivative of the field is going to pick up an extraneous term in its transformation. And this position-dependent term is a function varying with space-time position. It's not a covariant object. You have to fix that. So you cancel the unwanted term by introducing the gauge covariant derivative, where E now is the electric charge. The covariant derivative then transforms as shown. And we have introduced here an invented gauge field, an invented vector field, which has just the properties that we want to recover Maxwell. So that the Maxwell equations are going to be a consequence of gauge invariance. And then the resulting Lagrangian is invariant under joint local transformation of the matter field and of the gauge field. The added partial derivative exactly compensating the extraneous position dependent variation of the phase factor. So what the left hand introduces, the right hand removes. And this is coupling the free electron field with the electromagnetic field represented by the Faraday tensor. Um, and the conserved current appears in the interaction of, uh, as shown there in conformity with Maxwell theory, the new term is called a gauge field. And famously, um, Yang of Yang and Mills says the gauge argument here introducing local symmetries dictates the form of interaction of ma with matter fields. Okay, um, we're coming to the end. Um, we have physics should not depend on the physicist. Um, what does that really mean? Well, we have both coordinate and gauge transformations connected states that cannot be uh, physically distinguished, modulo some uh, uh, Hironov bohm uh, things. Both symmetries are not symmetries of nature, but of description of nature. These invariance principles remove arbitrariness introducing uh, by introducing a choice of a local starting point. That's where the arbitrariness is introduced. And both of these are demands of objectivity, uh, the coordinate and gauge transformations, because a constructed physical theory must be independent of any particular uh, starting locus, any infinitesimal locus. So 
the introduction of these arbitrary mathematical degrees of freedom at each point, either as functions of the four independent variables of space-time, um, uh, as determined by the field laws, or as an arbitrary function of coordinates signifying an internal gauge symmetry. And I want to say that for Weil, this mathematical arbitrariness is to be understood phenomenologically. Each point and its surrounding tangent space indifferently can be considered the locus of subjectivity of an experiencing constructing subject. The philosophical problem of the gauge principle is to understand why redundancy of description of physical states seems to be necessary. For example, the only renormalizable quantum field theories contain gauge theories, symmetries. Uh, more specifically, Steven Weinberg argues that the only way to form a relativistic quantum field theory of bosons is the gauge theory. Um, the great British philosopher of physics, Michael Redhead, um, argued around 2005, the gauge principle is generally regarded as the most fundamental cornerstone of modern theoretical physics. In my view, its elucidation is the most pressing problem in current philosophy of physics. Um, we talked about Atiyah's, how Weil had set the agenda for the second half of the 20th century. Well, this is one part of that agenda. There's another part. Um, Ilya Cartan uh, took the notion of a vial connection and generalized it even further. And this enabled him to carry over Felix Klein's group theoretic conception of geometry to the inhomogeneous spaces of GR and other uh, inhomogeneous spaces. And this is the basis of the modern fiber bundle treatment of differential geometry and differential topology. Well, played an uh, integral role in that. Um, just a little note on Cartan. Uh, by the great Berkeley uh, differential geometer, S.S. Chern, it was Ely Cartan who recognized that this notion of connection admits an important generalization beyond Weil, that the spaces for which the infinitesimal motion is defined need not be the tangent spaces of a Riemannian manifold, and that the group that operates in the space plays a dominant role. Um, you know, a little bit of shameless promotion, but um, there's also here, uh, a, I, it's a little small to read, it's the title page. There's a new uh, edition of, it's a reprint of the fifth edition with a 75 page introduction by Erhard Schultz and Domenico Giolini, in which the details of Vial's infinitesimal agenda are laid out in part. That came out in uh, last year. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for this clear and beautiful explanation of bile geometry. And now we are going to take uh, questions. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering about the relation between Wilde's ideas about gauge and the sort of recent school of thought that it's a gauge as being necessary because it, the degrees, gauge degrees of freedom represent something like handles by which systems couple. And I wondered if maybe that idea is sort of perhaps there already in the while and, and what he said about removing the restriction, finding the local access systems, or do you think that's completely new and not there anymore? Well, I think it's uh, implicit in while. I think that was really stated for the first time by Daniel Mills. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the real origin of it. But they were looking back at what Vial did yes. in 1954. So it, it seems like Weil was saying for, for gauge theories that all the important physics you get looking at things infinitesimally only. Mm -hmm. But there's topology in gauge theories and and um, you know things like instantons connect different topological sectors. Right. And um, so 
how does that affect Biles' thoughts about everything should be defined infinitesimally? <laughs> well, um, I think that the the infinitesimal program um, and its philosophical roots really was abandoned by Vial with um, quantum mechanics, except for this um, carryover into the theory of the electron in 1929. Um, and there he's not talking anymore about building up um, a theory from the infinitesimal anymore. He's only using the fact that the gauge transformations are uh, infinitesimal transformations of a Lie group, the U1 group. So he's given up the wider philosophical program of having a world geometry based on the infinitesimal by 1929. Okay. He's just taking his idea because it was so beautiful and he put it in the context of quantum mechanics and that's where it's been ever since. So, yeah. And can you get topology from building up for the, can you get global structure? No. So I was intrigued about the uh, comments, you, the historical comments about while thinking that the gauge principle only applies to general relativity. <clears throat> when the application to classical electromagnetism is so much uh, simpler and intuitive. So what, what caused the pain to drop for him when he said, aha, I can do this electromagnetism as well? What, was it really going into quantum and back? Or what, what, what was the evolution of his thought that, that we got him thinking about? It? Yeah, well, as I understand it, he was totally surprised when he, um, by looking at his length connection in 1918, and it had the form of a uh, identical math form of a, of a one form, which is just the, the uh, four potential. And so he said, why not identify them and take the derivative and boom, out come the Faraday equations. So it was a, it was a serendipitous unification. It wasn't intended. It just sprung about. It came out of the ground like a genie. <laughs> Uh, yes, I with the convention of physics uh, making this put a question only concerning the mathematical part. So, if perhaps someone before wanted to continue discussion about physics, then I can in the, in the, then I don't know, Jean Michel. But... Well, I, I, I was not uh, meaning to go into physics. Okay, so <laughs> my rather, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, philosophy, but okay. uh, you, you are as well. <laughs> okay, uh, in, the, in the one of the first slides, uh, you mentioned uh, the connection between infinitesimal and linear relations. You say mm -hmm. that the infinitesimal is what allows linear relations. Uh, my question is whether the uh, arrow or whale by really going to direction. Is that infinitesimal is something that a linearization or infinitesimal is linearization? So, what does it mean, mathematically speaking, infinitesimal is smaller for for bar? Yeah. It is not that it's just the tension to the linear uh, component, or there is something that being a component is simply a consequence of it. Yeah, Vial states, and I think he's right, that linear relations are. Um, in some sense, evident. Some sense? Evident in the Husserlian sense. They're simple. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, comprehensibility begins by building up from the linear structure of a tangent space in the, you know, basically in the Lie algebra of that space. Okay, so what are you saying is that the, the very notion of a, the linearization that Embody the very notion of infinitesimal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You sure. Well, uh, I, I I love to talk. Uh, I want to start with that. Uh, but uh, my second point is that in the beginning of the talk, you insisted that uh, Hermann Weil should be the hero of MPP. This could be a debate. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, uh, then I, I I listened to the talk and I was wondering uh, 
how do you present us a, uh, a way of philosophy to help help out physics, something like that? And so, uh, I, I'm, I'm, from what I understand, you, you, you mentioned two philosophical contents uh, behind gauge theories. Mm. And uh, these two contents are, on the one side, Husserlian idea of uh, nature has to be objectivized. Yeah. And uh, second component, uh, subjectivity could be identified with our, our relation to infinitism. Yeah. Uh, so th this gives a philosophical inspiration, but then the work uh, seems to be in part independent of it. Uh, but uh, my, my problem is that uh, in which way can we still say that philosophy uh, is useful for physics in, in this context. Uh, I have the feeling that it's at, I, I, it's, it, it, it's true at a very definitional, uh, in, in a very definitional way, because we understand physics as objectivizing the world, the nature. And uh, here, uh, mathematics are involved in this objectivization. So it's not exactly that uh, philosophy is useful for physics, but we have a definition, uh, we have the, basically the Kantian, Kantian definition of physics yeah. as, as objectivization of, of nature through mathematics. Yeah, no, that's, that's precisely it. Yeah. This is a, um, a canonical illustration of not just a philosophical argument, but an actual construction yeah. that shows how it can be done. Now, admittedly, it's the world of classical field yeah. physics. Um, and I think that I think that's worth pointing out to physicists as well. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a flat-footed realist in, in physics, but I think a little philosophical reflection may be assisted by some uh, knowledge of how things have gone in the past may change those uh, flat-footed realists into more sophisticated views of what physical theories mean and what they can mean about ob objectification, precisely. Yeah, I wanted to go back, uh, if, we, if we take that, our discussion into a quant quantum uh, gauge fields, you mentioned, you mentioned the Arnold-Bohm effect as a realization of the presumed physical importance of these fields, not only the magnetic field, not only the, the electromagnetic field. I was wondering if you could comment on the Fidei of Popov ghosts and how and how they come into uh, the quantum theory of gauge fields. No, uh, I, 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 I'm going to have to refrain from from doing that. I, I just don't know uh, enough about ghost particles. This is a follow up to Jean Michel's question. Um, I didn't quite understand your answer because. It's, and also because you actually mentioned at the beginning of your talk that um, the um, genealogy of uh, physical idea or physics ideas uh, might shed light on things in some ways. But um, so I want to combine what I just heard in that thought as a question, which is um, it's not clear to me that the fact that Weil thought that what he was doing was an objectification of nature, mm -hmm. that it's necessarily the case that we must understand the result of what he did as the objectification of nature. And I take it that, uh, and, and you are alluding to the context of discovery and context of justification distinction in a more modern and sophisticated way. But it seems to me that if we want to understand what the in a relationship is between philosophic thought and um, objectifying nature, then we want something stronger than look at how we arrived at the ideas. No. Well, um, how we arrived at this representation. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, maybe you do. I mean, maybe you you want something um, uh, uh, more contemporary, perhaps. No, um, I, I think it'd be okay if you could say like there's a, actually an inner conceptual uh, contingent conceptual necessity between this construction and the philosophic views that he holds. 
but it looks more here that the philosophic views are kind of an, an aid to discovery, but not a, perhaps not even a necessary aid to discovery. I took that to be part of the challenge well, to Michelle's question. Um, look, it's a contingent fact that Weil had this um, background in uh, or knowledge of phenomenology when he was um, introduced to Einstein's wife, theory. That's so contingent. Yeah, yeah. Well, his wife, yeah. Um, uh, that could have been different. He could have married someone else who didn't, you know, have that knowledge or uh, or want it. Um, but I think that to, to get to your point of um, is is it in some sense helping us to understand um, what um, a modest kind of um, view of a physical theory might be that goes beyond, say, for example, scientific realism. And um, certainly Weil goes on to develop that point of view in what he calls symbolic construction yes. in his book, uh, on Philosophy of Mathematics and Natural Science. And it's a little murky in, in that book unless you know somewhere something about where do these symbols come from and, and what meaning do they have? And this th that comes out of this rich nexus of thinking about um, um, symbols as invested with meaning through constitution uh, and evidence, whether it's Brower in intuition or, or it's something else. And um, he was a constructivist of quite a good order and for a bit. And then he, um, you know, just abandons the construction and goes more or less like Hilbert does with, um, uh, you know, a finite part of mathematics and an ideal infinite part of mathematics. Um, we had the talk on on the infinite here. Somebody mentioned that earlier this week. So I guess my 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 response is is simply that um, if we have some sort of historical knowledge of how th these ideas come about, how they were important to the people who uh, were the bearers of those ideas, who invented them and um, their original significance. And then they lose that significance because they become pragmatically very useful. Um, but does it matter that we trace them back to uh, their origin to understand where they came? And when I teach, I usually always teach that um, I never understand an idea until I know where it comes from. And I think that kind of um, gives me a better sense of what the signification of a concept is today if I know where it originated. Any question? Uh, I would like to, to make just a small, small comment. Of course, uh, we can't resist admiring uh, this universal mind hmm. and by going from uh, uh, integral equation to physics, but to number theory, because he was also the creator of the public distribution law mm -hmm. and spectral geometry yeah. about the Laplacian and so on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to, to say that the wide geometry is mathematically natural because if we consider a third order linear differential equation and in order that this linear third order linear differential equation is the tensor product of two uh, second order differential equation, we should have uh, some invariant that we call uh, Laguerre invariant z equal to zero. And if we want to do the same theory for no linear differential equation, third order no linear differential equation, we need naturally to use by geometry. geometry. So by geometry, uh, maybe didn't solve the physics problem for which this was created, but it solved a lot of mathematical problems. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you've written about this, but Erhard Schultz has. Um, do you know Erhard? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the invariant corresponding to Lagarde invariant it is yeah, what like we call Wunschmann invariant. Yeah. And uh, Eddie Carton wrote a lot about it. Thank you very much. Any other question? So we have two minutes before the next. That's thanks.